Uh, you play don't you, right? I thought he was going to play the guitar. I said, don't you play the guitar. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's long enough. That'll work. Praise the Lord, everybody. Aren't you glad you had the resurrection in you this morning when the sun come up? spot of trying to think of something. Amen. Yeah, when the sun come up this morning and woke everything up around me, I kind of went out on the front porch and looked, and the birds were singing a resurrection song. The little squirrels are jumping around. They look like they're just full of the resurrection. And I thought to myself, if the people of God was as happy over life as they are, you see, they don't, they don't have anything of yesterday that's worrying them. They're just glad for today. And I sit there and I was drinking all my coffee and looking at the little critters out there. And the Spirit of the Lord began to let me know that if we could live for God the way those little creatures do, then we wouldn't have a problem either. Hey, Brother Shepherd, that's impossible. It seems impossible. But then there is nothing impossible with God. So I'm glad for that resurrection. A lot of people went to church this morning that will never go to church the rest of the year. That's the way it's always been, down around my way. People will come to church on Easter. And uh, it is a very important thing. But if that resurrection is not already in you, then you ain't got nothing to celebrate. That's right. Amen. I'm glad that I'm not looking for a resurrection. Jesus told some of them at Lazarus' grave, he said, I am the resurrection. And if you have him, you have that resurrection. Amen. Well, if you ain't already done been resurrected, then I don't see what you would be looking forward for for something down the road. Because he said, that that raised him from the dead, if it was in you, it's got to be in you. Then it would quicken your mortal body. And I'm glad of that. I'm glad that I understand a little bit about the resurrection. It wasn't just something that happened back there. Well, if it hadn't have been for the resurrection back there, I couldn't be justified up here. We got, you know, the justification is, God's righteousness in us. His righteousness in us. Because of that, back there, I have God's righteousness now because of the resurrection that always was. So if I have his resurrection in me, I have his, res I have his righteousness I have his justification, and if I have his justification, amen, I don't only have the righteousness of God, 
That qualifies me to be a son. And this stunts a lot of people here. But you know what a son, if you've got a son, I remember when Brother Bob's son here was a little fella. But he come to full maturity. He's still a son, but he now he does everything that the father does. The prodigal son, if we look at that scripture, the prodigal son, in Pentecost back there, I always thought they were preaching at me, trying to get me to the altar. And that was a good thing they were trying to do because I needed it. And I heard that message. But then one day, and I was looking in the scripture, and I said, well, the natural part of that, the natural part of that prodigal son is going back to his homeland even right now. They're getting on planes and people giving them money and they're flying that, they're fr flying that prodigal son back to his homeland. That's, just, that's for a sign. But spiritually, on the spiritual side of that prodigal son, that prodigal son got a family signet ring when he got back to the father's house. What did that ring do? It gave him the authority of everything that the Father is. That's what that ring was for. You know, for years I didn't know, and they didn't preach it to me, and they didn't tell me. God showed it to me. There was, was a reason that that Father, when that son come back home, that family signet ring, Gave him the authority of everything that the Father had. Amen. So then, if you can say amen to that, then you can say amen to this. That son, somewhere down the line, comes everything that the Father is. That's what Jesus said. He thanked God that he and the Father were one. And he prayed that same thing for me, Brother Bob. Make them one as you and I are one. So then it don't amaze, it don't really trip me up when he said, ye are gods. Ye are gods. Oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you're gods. <laughs> you're gods. That's what the Bible said. You're gods. I'm coming, son. I'm waiting on you. You ain't waiting on me. Amen. Ye are gods. Now, if you take that the wrong way, you'll wind up on the dark side the way Lucifer did. Oh, he thought the same thing. He thought the same thing. So there is an order for everything even for us, in sonship, and the authority, you know this old world's got, it's got its kingdoms, it's got, it's started, start, there's a kingdom even under the ground, and uh, we call it the mineral kingdom, and it's expanding. We're using more out of the ground now than we ever have. Have to have it to run our automobiles and everything else coming out of that mineral kingdom. Where, where, where this old flesh come from? From the dust. And then you got the green flowers and trees on the top side, the floral kingdom. Then you got the animal kingdom that... It supports, and you go out there, and you see the animal kingdom living off of this other kingdom. And then man is over that kingdom. Then you say, well, what's over the man? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is over that man. But there, there's another kingdom that a lot of people don't stop to think about, and this, this controls most of their life. There's a kingdom between here and God 
called the principalities and the powers of the air. That is the kingdom. The kingdom of darkness. But Brother Bob, God gave us as sons or as God's power over that kingdom. Over that kingdom. We have power over that kingdom. Amen. So the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Amen. There is nothing that stands in the way between you and God. Nothing. Unless you let it. Amen. Nothing. There's a lot in that old dark kingdom. It can control you. It can bind you. It can kill you. It can do a, it destroy you because that's what it came. That's what that kingdom was about. When that kingdom fell, then it was going to take and destroy God's kingdom. Oh, but we're here. We're here. If we hadn't have been here, Brother Bob, I thought, well, the devil's done one. And a lot of times in my life, it looked like that he had done one. I mean, really looked like he had done one. Amen. I, I've been so working in this kingdom of God. I've been with my back against the wall till I pray, God, if I just had one, I mean a real one, a real one. If I just had one, and I said, Lord, give me one, and he started giving them to me. Amen. Had an old peel head walked in this morning with his two little youngins. Pretty little old youngins. That's what God gave me. And another walked in, a little old girl with shorts on. Most everybody would have stopped her at the door. But I let her come on in. She heard the gospel and she come down to, she's praying in the altar. Praying there. Come to church with shorts on, Brother Shepherd. Yeah. I said, God, give me some of them. Give me some of them. I'm tired of this other stuff that wants to be so spiritual and holy and tell everybody what the visions and the revelations they got and ain't got nothing. God, send me to the highway. Send me to the hedges. I compel them to come to the house of God. And I dare anybody to run them off. I dare anybody to run them off. Amen. I'm so sick and tired of this religious thing. I want to see somebody, amen, become sons and daughters of God. Amen. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty particular over, amen, what God sends you. Amen. Amen. When you, when you see the gospel, of the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. It makes some of the devils mad, and I'm glad. But then it causes little tears to run down their eyes, and they'll be down there looking for this God. Looking for this God. And you know what? They come to the right place and found him. Found him, Brother Paul. Found him. Amen. I'm like Jesus. I'm pretty hard on Pharisee, hypocrite, Sadducee. Amen to God. Just give me the sinners and the publicans. Amen. Just give me, just give me the sinners and the publicans, and I'll even go home and eat with them. That's like Jesus did. Amen. And they come and they'll do me and you the same way they done Jesus. Now, I can't believe that you got something like that sitting in your church. Well, I can. I can believe it. Hey, Amen. If you've been through all this other stuff much as I have, you'd be glad to see, hey, amen, some of them sinners and publicans. Hey, amen. I'm glad for them, Brother Greg. I appreciate them. Hey, amen. Sister Irene, I just fell in love with the sinners and the publicans. I really, really have. Amen. And I appreciate the Lord. Oh, we're all the time. 
from one day to the next, we go through one little change and then another, but I got to where I don't mind that. I can't much tell you now what I'm going to do tomorrow. I used to could. I can't too much tell you what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, but whatever it is, it'll be connected to the kingdom of God. Amen. And long as, as long as, my brother, as long as I'm connected to that, I don't care what it is that God's got me doing or where it's at, where he wants me to go. Amen. And there's a world, listen, listen, church, there's a whole new crop out there now. Amen. There's a whole new crop out there now. Amen. There's a whole new crop out there, and I begin to see them. Amen. They come in, and they've never heard this resurrection message. They've heard Jesus, but they really haven't heard what he really is. He's just a figure of speech to most of the world. But you know, it don't take pulling up, up out of wheelchairs, and, and I like that too. I like to be around that and, and see people delivered and healed of their physical conditions. But you know, when this is preached in demonstration and power of love, Brother, they'll jump out of the wheelchair and run to the altar. Yes, Amen. Right. So we got a greater day than what they had back there in that healing revival where you realize it or not. People looking back to the healing revival, talking about what a great day, and we're in a greater day. My God, getting somebody out of a wheelchair can't compare. Amen to God. And watch somebody being born into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Don't you love him? Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Give me a D chord. I'll try to do you something. I don't know how in the world you can enjoy this, but we, if you can enjoy it, I can sure try. <laughs> they tell me of a man who walked. The shores of Galilee, they tell me of a man that heals, who can make the blind to see. They tell me that he has great power, he can make the lame to walk, and they tell me that he has such power he could make the dumb to talk you ever met that Jesus oh this is why I'm thankful why I pray and sing and shout for God himself put something in here and the world can't get that out well, I'm thankful that when I didn't know how to pray, but he heard my plea anyway. And I'm thankful that Jesus saved me for all of time and eternity. Don't you love him? He's building me a mansion there. I love him. More and more, I know someday that I'll live with him somewhere on another shore. He's been so kind and good to me. He's with me in all my strife. And I know that one day soon I'll be under the tree of life. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Amen. Jesus said in my father's house are many mansions. If you really could get a hold of that, amen, and not just think about some little dream land way somewhere, but the but the real power to that 
then you'll begin to realize who you are in God. Amen. And if you are sick, you'll, for, you'll get where you'll forget about it. Amen. I was hurting pretty bad in my back and I come in here. It's still there, but you know, unless I mention it right now, I didn't even know it. Amen. You see, we're in this world, but we're not of it. Amen. And so all of this that he done, he justified us. How did he do that? He done it by the Spirit. That's the way he justified us, by the Spirit. We think of everything that he done at Calvary, and we think of the story that they tell at the end of Matthew and at the end of Mark and at the end of Luke and the next to the end of the chapter in John. And we tell about the empty tomb, and we tell about the story of the who was there first and who he seen on down the line. And for the next 40 days, we tell of that, but we really haven't really got a hold, the most of the church hasn't got hold of that what that resurrection done. It didn't just bring, it didn't just raise him back up. It raised us up with him. Amen. And if there hadn't have been no resurrection, there wouldn't have been no justification. Or I couldn't have, I couldn't have this authority of God. I couldn't have this righteousness of God because mine ain't going to get the job done. I don't mind telling you. My righteousness ain't, ain't going to get the job done. I, I thought when I was growing up in those churches back there that we'd done everything they said. But, Lord, they couldn't even. It didn't even do them no good. It's a truth. Why, they wound up doing worse things than I was. Amen. And they, what it was, they never got a hold of what the Spirit done for them. They had it wrote down in a book. And they didn't realize that the Spirit had to do it. The Spirit had to give you this righteousness of God. Amen. It's the Spirit that has to give you, amen, this resurrection. You can't get this by degree. Amen. And, and, and all of those other things are good, I guess, but you got to get everything that happened at the resurrection is passed on by the Spirit from then till now. The Holy Ghost. Amen. The, whole, the Holy Ghost had to come by the Spirit. Amen. That's the reason why Paul had to forget everything and get to, he called it revelation, but a revelation is the Spirit, revealing Spirit of God. That's what the revelation really is. We talk revelation like we, uh, you know, we've been in this a long, long time. Folk, we ain't even touched the threshold of it. Amen. And that's the reason why that I love to find somebody that's got this resurrection in them and get around. And Jeanette said, where are you going to church? I said, well, I told Brother Greg the other day I'd try to come down there and see him. I'm going off down there. Amen. I want to hear anything from anybody that's got this revelation of the resurrection in them. Because when they do that, it feeds me, Brother Bob. It feeds me. Yeah, I'll drive an hour and a half, amen, to get fed. Amen. Won't you? Praise God. What is it? What's taking place? Oh, something great is happening right now. It's, we hear so much about what's coming. What's co and they're missing this thinking it's coming looking for something that's coming. You see, when they was at Lazarus' tomb there, they said, Lord, we know in that day. And they just couldn't get it that it was already their day. It was already there, standing there looking at them. Brother Bob, 
I've been dumb for a long time. You'd be surprised how many years I went and didn't know that. Amen. Because I kept looking for something. They said, great move of God's coming. The great move of God's coming. Well, the great move of God is in you. That's the greatest move that there'll ever be. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory is a lot more powerful, amen, than throwing down a crutch. Throwing down a walking stick or throwing down a pill. <laughs> Lord, fill me up with this, Jesus. Brother Greg. This afternoon as I was sitting at the house or laying down, I went straight home, didn't eat this afternoon, but I laid down and the Lord began to, to speak to me. The Lord began to speak to me. There's one thing that I, get this mic turned down quick, brother. I, I'm going to blow this thing out worse than my back is. The the Lord began to show me this morning, the deeper that you dig that hole that I was talking about this morning inside of Golgotha, the deeper that you dig the hole, the more the cross that it'll take to fill that hole up. So you have to dig deep inside to get rid of all the problems and the circumstances that was there on Golgotha. But I want to leave Golgotha's hill tonight. And I want to take you on a journey a little bit further down because they, they come and they got him off of the cross and they took him to a borrowed tomb. Christ never had anything to do with death, so he never looked to death. Do you know that he never died? Christ never died. Well, I can argue with that. Over, you can argue with me all you want to. You can't argue with the Bible. He never died. He gave up the ghost for a little while, but he never died. Now, when we begin to what to look at the graveyard and the tomb out there, we think that that is the end of it, but Christ didn't. Right. See, if you begin to look at the body of Christ, when Christ was uh, walking the earth, he utilized his body different than anybody else on the earth did. When they come against him and it wasn't his time to go to the cross, he just disappeared right. from in their sight. It was easy for him to walk through walls or to walk through barriers because he did not fixate his mind on a tomb. Come on, bless the Lord. And I wanted to talk to you for just a few moments tonight is don't get fixated on the tomb. Don't get fixated on the grave. It doesn't mean anything for a people that's not going to die. Come on, bless the Lord. They ask me all the time, they say, Brother Grave, you got a grave, a site picked out. I said, I don't plan on using one. I don't have one picked out, Brother Clifford. I told the church here that if by way that I gave my son instructions, that if by way I goofed up and I did go by the way of the grave, don't put me in the dirt. Put me in a little old above ground concrete vault, stick me right in front of the doorsteps of the church. Because I figured that the church folks had aggravated me so much it'd be my time to aggravate them back. <laughs> if they was going to get anything from God, they were going to have to get around me to get to it. Praise you, Lord. Now begin to think about this afternoon is don't fixate yourself on the tomb. Get your eyes beyond the tomb. At no time was Christ ever in the tomb. They took a body that he used. An image. That's the only reason that he ever had an image was people's got to see something in the natural. They cannot look into the spiritual mind. Yeah. So they only had an image of what Christ would be like. And it had to look just like them. Yeah. Had to look just like them or they wouldn't have accepted it. Now, Brother Clifford was talking about the little old young lady coming in in shorts and and sure enough, if you talk to a lot of people, it would upset them. That's right. But you want to know something? She had clothes on. That's right. That's right. When Jesus come walking back and he found the, the disciples on the seashore, Peter was naked. 
And I don't know what you think. Come on in, Lord. I don't know what you think, but naked is without any clothes on. And Peter had to hide himself because he was found naked. Don't get fixated on the tomb. When Christ come in off of the, when they brought him down and they laid that body, that image down in that tomb for a little while and they, they put the burial clothes on him, they done everything that they were supposed to do, they thought. The Bible says that immediately that he was found. He told even the, the one on the cross, he said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And the Bible said immediately he was found in the earth teaching those that at one time was disobedient, giving them an option to come out if they wanted to. So he began to do these kind of things, but as far as the tomb was concerned, it was a borrowed place just for an image. And we want to put Christ in that image. But Christ was never in the tomb. At no point was he there. Now inside of this, the old saying is that that uh, 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 an example, when you go out to eat in a fine dining restaurant, you take the napkin, and, and if you're a, a gentleman, you take that napkin and you stretch that napkin out and you lay it down on your leg. Didn't nobody teach me these things growing up. I had to learn by watching. So they began to, you take the napkin and you lay it down on your lap, and you eat, and then you just raise it up and, and clean yourself at times. But the whole point that when you are through eating, you take that napkin and you fold that napkin and you put it to the side, and that lets the waiter know that you no longer need that table, that you are finished with what you're going to do with that table. So in the process, we come to find out that Christ, when Mary Magdalene come down there and the rest of them come down there, they found nobody in the tomb. This is why I don't have to worry about getting up early on Sunday morning once a year and run out there to see if Christ rose. He was never there when they got there. He's not going to be there when you get there. He's going to already be gone. Why? Because you're lagging behind in the image trying to find him somewhere where he isn't. So as he began to do this, he began to, to we see that the grave clothes was laid in one position, but the facial napkin was somewhere different. And it was a symbol that he was through with the image perceived that y'all was going to look at. That that image no longer meant anything. He didn't need the tomb no more. It was, it was only borrowed for an instant to lay down an image. But yet, we get fixated on the graveyard. We get fixated on a tomb. We get fixated on... What is the afterlife going to be like? When sons and daughters of God should never be fixated on the tomb. The Apostle Paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Now i got news for you. That didn't have nothing to do with death either. To be absent from this body is to get out of the mind of the flesh and get over into the mind of God that He can begin to speak to you and deliver you and take you into worlds that you've never known. But you've got to be crucified to this flesh. The only time, the only time that we find Christ using that same image that he had was on one disciple that did not believe. And his statement was, until I put my fingers into his side and thrust them into them nail-scarred hands, I won't believe. Only time that an image is ever used is in unbelief to prove that it actually happened. But see, that body never could die. It had dimensions beyond measure. It had understanding beyond measure that it could cross through any barriers. And that's the exact same way if we be the mind of God, if we be the son of God, if we be the daughter of God, we should never worry about this image. We ought to be able to cross any barrier that comes before us. We ought to be able to walk into dimensions that is beyond the comprehension of mankind. Have you ever been into a situation where you just wish that you wasn't there? You say, my God, how in the world did I get caught up into this? Why am I here? 
and then something changed and maybe they got a phone call distracted them and you could turn and just walk off. Or maybe you got a phone call. Something happened that took you out of that problem. That's the same way that Christ was. He just walked through the other dimensions of the mind. So we begin to see if we get fixated on a tomb, then we begin to look forward to it. Because we think that's where God is. And we think that after that, that we're going to make it. But that's not the image that God has perceived for us. God wants us to be like Him, that we be translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. We talk about Melchizedek. We talk about all these wonderful things that's going on. But the Bible said this. He said the law and the prophets was until John. I preached a message one time, if you was able to hear it. If not, Brother Stan's probably got it on record. That the law and the prophets was until John. That John ended the understanding. John ended all these things, but after that the kingdom was to be preached. Moving us out of this world that we live in to an understanding that is beyond our comprehension in a human form. There's no reason why we should have problems on this earth if we would just get out of the earth. I talked to you this morning about the cross and, and after it was plunged inside of the earth that all that blood went down inside the earth. They had to dig a hole, Brother Clifford. They had, to, they had to take and put that cross. And when it jolted down, it's like setting a pole. When it jolted down, all that blood just gushed down. But see, it wasn't on the earth, because on the earth wouldn't do anything for me or you, but it had to be in the earth. So it had to go down where the blood would cleanse and it would flow and it would cure the problems and the heartaches and troubles and trials that we face. So all that soaked down inside there. All that moved inside of you. Every time, that's why I said sometimes we need to dig deeper and get the hole a lot bigger that the cross can fit down a whole lot more. That it take us from one understanding or from one glory to another. Don't get fixated on the tomb. For after the tomb we find Christ Walking with brethren that did not know who he was. Now that's a, that's a kicker, isn't it? Bless him, Lord. Could you walk with somebody and talk with them and be talking about them, but yet you don't know them? But he said when he broke the bread, he said their eyes was open and they saw him for who he was. But that image didn't need to be there no more. You never find the image of God in, a, in, in that, that the people is wanting to see Him in a natural, but they recognized Him in the spiritual from then on. They could understand because He said He disappeared out of their sight. The flesh did. Why He said, don't know no man by the flesh, but know Him by the Spirit. Know Him after that Spirit, that Holy Ghost that Brother Clifford was talking about. Know Him after these things. What will revelate your mind into an understanding greater than, you could, than, than you've ever heard before? The image of the cross was only borrowed for just a little while. This is why people get fixated on Christmas and they say, oh, He's in a manger and a lot of people leave Him. In a manger. They don't never let him grow up. They don't never let him become a man. They always want to keep him a baby so they can tell him when to shut up. Then they hang him up on the cross and they want to leave him on the cross where they can say he died. How in the world could a spirit die? He never died. He said, I lay this body down, I'll pick it back up what he said and he proved it he walked upon them right there with the image that they wanted to see but yet they could not even see after resurrection that it was him but they knew when he broke the bread that it was different 
Peter, James, John, all of them walked with him, the 80. He told them, he said, if you drink of my blood and eat of my body, then you can have part with me. And they said, you're so bloody, we don't want nothing to do with you. And they turned around and walked away. He even looked at his 12 and said, will you also leave me? Where can we go? You have the words to eternal life. Don't get fixated on the tomb. Look to the resurrection. Begin to, to just do away with that image. It doesn't mean anything to you. To a lot of the world it does. That's the way they're going. They don't have no choice. They made a, they, 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 like Red said, they have the death walk. They made a concrete abiding Contract with death, and that's the way they're going to go. But you can't die. You wasn't born to die. You was born to live. You was born to have life and have life more abundant. You was born for a better day than what we have even seen yet. I know it ain't been a shout message tonight, but that's all right. Brother Clifford touched on something talking about the great healing days. In 1890, 1899, I forget the, the man's name, but he was the one that Izuzu Street came in under. And it ran to night, like 1909. It worked in there. But he made a statement. He said in about a hundred years, there's going to be a revival greater than Izuzu Street. We are crossing into a dimension, folks, that is beyond healing. What is better, to be healed or never get sick? What is better, to have the lame walk or they never get where they're messed up? The Bible said, and I'm plain and simple on this, the Bible said, if Christ is near you or in you, that Satan won't be. Sickness cannot come nigh your dwelling. These things can't happen if the Father is abiding in you and you in the Father. Come on. Lord, thank you, Jesus. So what's our problem? Our problem is we're not sincere with God. we got a form of godliness, but we're denying the power thereof. We want to be known as Christians, but we don't want to be Christ-like. We want to talk the talk, but nobody wants to put shoe leather to the highway. Nobody wants it. Why? Because it may not go along with the image that you have prepared that you think Christ is. The days that the elders talked about is here. But you can only reach into those if you're not in the image of the natural. You can only reach further than the flesh if you don't have flesh. Being brutally beat and distorted and all these things that Christ went through was showing the, the effectual working that you had to destroy your image. Your image doesn't mean anything. Those days of I can get a bigger tent than you can. One of the, my greatest ministers that I really love to, to listen to, he had a problem if he didn't have the biggest tent there was. He died at 39 years of age. This big I and little U's is not what God's all about. He said the first of many brethren. If we're brethren, then we're all alike. We've got the same inheritance, and we're working together to build an estate. I talked to uh, uh, a man years ago when I was about 16 years old. We sold him pine straw. We built the mansion up here in Loganville. And he sold it to Burt Reynolds and moved over to Athens, and he really did build him a home over in Athens. 
And I was talking to him one time, and uh, he had a, a stack of envelopes like this on the side of his desk, and he was going to write me a check for some pine straw. And we had walked, he'd done showed me everything come from India and all this beautiful work that he'd done in his home. And he was looking there, and he got upset. He said, what is this I got in my hand? bunch of envelopes, real thick, and he throwed it to the side. Carl Newton's his name. He throwed it to the side. He said, oh, that's just a stock on my oil wells. I was 16 years old. I said, Mr. Newton, do you need to adopt a son? I said, would you like for me to be your grandson? Would you be willing to adopt me? He said, son, all I'm trying to do is set up an inheritance for my family. Jesus has an inheritance set up. He's got an estate settled, and it's beyond the tomb. He's got something in mind and in store for you that your little old minds could not comprehend. But, he said he'd reveal it to us. By his Spirit. He would reveal it to us. He would show it to us if we would have it. All you have to do is go beyond the tomb. Go beyond the tomb. Get far out of its sight. Because as long as you are pre preparing for death, then death is what you're going to do. But if you're preparing to live, that's a whole different story. Then we can see what God really wants us to be and what to do. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. It wasn't a shouting message tonight, Brother Jake. But it was all that I could do. <laughs> it was all I could do. Wore out, tired in the flesh, rejuvenated in the spirit. These things that, that we talk about, they're not fairy tales, y'all. I want you to know there's nothing that I say that you can't have. I was thinking about Brother Matthew after we was coming back a while ago. and I was thinking about this, Matthew. I, I'd asked you this morning, you had two weeks to come up with, well, I mean two months, to, to accumulate the first of the payments of this new home. Why not just pay the thing off? What could happen in two months? Why should he be burdened down with a house payment? He's already burdened down with a wife. Why in the world have house payments to go along with them kind of troubles? Why not just accumulate the money in two months to do away with the problems? Is it possible? Well, we got a man sitting right here that said he had to have at least two years college education to be over the airport that he was working for, but the man told him, said, I want you to go take the test. He said, there's no sense in me taking the test. I don't have the qualification. The owner said, or the manager said, go take the test. He'd already given him the job. He just had to manifest it. God's already given us everything that we need. We just have to manifest what it is coming about to get it. Believe it. Then it's done. Amen. It's completed in him. I love that part. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, come with your shouting shoes on. Maybe the Lord will refresh us. He might just send Brother Matthew back home, let him stay home for a few days. You don't never know what God's got in store. I thank Brother Clifford and Sister Jeanette for coming down and being with me on such a great day.